I think that first panel was really interesting, and I was really pleased that we didn't see any fights amongst the different sectors of, a di of the um, society, that everyone seems to agree that we do have a common problem, we do need to work together. What we want to do, though, is in this panel sort of explain and explore how and why, because I really don't want to disappoint Mark. He said if we're still having the same conversation again in 10 years, he'll be really upset. We don't want to upset Mark. That would be very bad for us. So we really do want to sort of look at this and explore well, how do we get there? We seem to have a lot of tools. We seem to have a lot of the will. What's missing? Where is it? So we really want to explore this today. So um, just before we start, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, I'm going to do a very short introduction. And I'll let everyone sort of um, say a bit more about themselves. To my immediate um, left is Anna Maria Hubert, who is the lead for uh, Ernst & Young in Eastern Canada. Next to her is Brooke Strzok, who is a former can't read because I can't read my own writing here. Um, <laughs> former research director of uh, Decision Lab and strategy of a uh, strategy facilitator. Yeah. Um, next to him is um, Sanjay Khanna, who's a futurist, um, uh, chief senior uh, futurist for um, covering crisis consortium. And finally, um, Karen Restel, who is a co-founder of Bold Realities, Whose Land, and also a contributor to um, Hubcats.ca. So I think my first question is going to be, we always told start um, positively, but I don't believe in following rules. <laughs> so I want to actually ask a question that's not normally asked. I've been told not to use my daughter as a prop. She hates it when I refer to her, but I'm going to anyway. Chiefly, Anjo used her son's example. I'm going to use my daughter. She comes to me and asks, Dad, why are you going to this? Shouldn't this be just easy to do? Why don't people just do this? We're at COP15. COP happens, biodiversity COP happens over two years, 15, I mean 30 years we've been doing this. Silent Spring came out before I was born. That's a long, long time ago. Far too long. That's why I can't read. Um, why is this taking us so long? What aren't we doing right? Why don't we get this? A, from the first panel, there's a lot of goodwill. What's wrong? Why can't we get this right? So. Brooke, let me start with you. What are we doing wrong? So uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having us here. Excited about this conversation. And thanks also to the first panel. Um, as I mentioned to one of the panelists, I'm making it my personal mission to make sure that there is continuity from what they were talking about to what we are talking about now. Um, nominally, this panel has something to do with behavioral science, uh, which is the world that I have been most, work most recently working in. Um, and so this is the relationship that I want to draw. One of the things that came up a number of times on the last panel um, was, was, I think, nicely captured uh, when Jay said, don't go and approach communities saying, we want something from you. Don't decide in advance what it is that you want um, and then go and try and get their buy-in or coerce them or something of that nature. Um, and kind of the, the implied second part of that was decide together. And that starts with approaching people with a willingness to listen, not reverence, you know, saying, oh, well, I, I am nothing, you are all, I must, you know, kind of drink from the fountain, no, no, but also not approaching them as less than. They are people like us. We meet them eye to eye. Seek to understand and then to be understood. And implied in that is treating people as worthy of being understood. And that's something that's really been missing. And that is what brings me to the point about behavioral science. Behavioral science has for a long time been used as a substitute for collective deliberation. Rather than having us meet each other as equals and decide on how we are going to frame a problem and ideate solutions together and debug those solutions together, instead, some of us have made decisions about how a problem is going to be framed and about what the solution ought to be. And then we've used tools like behavioral science as well as other tools to try to kind of extract compliance from other people, to get them to play along with what we have decided uh, ought to be done. And usually that's we have decided other people ought to do rather than we have decided we ought to do. Um, we design choice environments in order to change others. And fundamentally, that's only going to get us so far. And especially when we start encountering these really big challenges like inequality, like biodiversity loss, like, you know, substantial uh, challenges to environmental sustainability. Um, these require massive change and that kind of little bit of extra push that you can get 
out of just managing to kind of refine and polish your conversion rates with behavioral science, it's just not going to be powerful enough for those kinds of deep problems. Those deep problems are the ones that expose that underlying challenge that we are not meeting each other as equals and we are not defining problems together. And so people feel excluded from our dialogues. And I think that that's all I want to say for now. I definitely will come back to more later, but that'll, that'll do. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, Emery, I want to talk to you, I want to turn to you because as a consultant for um, EY and as a business uh, consultancy and, and, and dealing with all this, again, how do the businesses, they must get this. They're not stupid. Why is it again taking, why is it so hard that, to make the progress? We do see some, but why don't we see more after this long? I think there are driving forces that prevent the businesses from doing the right things. And it's a fundamental dysfunctioning of capital markets. Um, it was supposed to be designed to create value and distribute value. And that's no longer what it is these doing. Um, that's why we need different metrics for value creation to drive capital allocation. Number of players saw that um, early 2000s when the uh, United Nations uh, brought together 25 large institutional investors and said, well, could you use your money to help business drive value while creating value for more people? 25 of them, including the case of the people were at the table. They said, yeah, you're right. But how do you do that? And that was the beginning of principles for responsible investments. And everybody embarked in a disconnected way. Uh, too many initiatives, everyone wants to do the same, but not enough coordination. So in the early 2000s, people got it. You saw, you created this because you wanted coordination, collaboration, too many initiatives, not enough focus. Um, when Mark Carney was uh, leading Bank of Canada, he saw that capital markets didn't not work. He did a few things that led him to become the uh, leader of the Bank of England. And he realized that the scientifics, when he saw the scientific reports on climate, he said, okay, how can I link it to my job? And he spoke to CEOs in the insurance industry. He said, oh, you guys, you're great at projections. You get data, you have actuaries, and you project to determine how much you're gonna pay to insure against a risk that will come in the long term, whether it's a disease that will cause that, whether it's a more fires, more this, more that. So if this science is exact, your business is at risk and the financial system is at risk. And that's when there was a decision to have TCFD, Task Force on Climate Financial Disclosure, to preserve the stability of financial markets, 37 central banks joining force to do that. This time at COP, central banks got together again on nature. So okay, you bankers, you finance businesses, what the heck do they use to produce their material? So 46% of what they use to produce the products we consume comes from nature. Well, guess what, at this pace, you can no longer produce your material. You're out of business. So we probably have a risk with the banking system this time. So therefore, a number of central banks are saying, oh, we need to take that on. And the same way we say we need to price climate in every financial decision, we will need to price nature in every financial decision. And as Pamela alluded to, the ISSB is providing standards for investors, the ones who put money, whether you lend or whether you invest, uh, consulted, it's a, it's a due process to establish standards for investors. And they consulted globally, the investment and the business community said, okay, not only do we need climate, we need biodiversity, and you need less inequality, so human rights and diversity and inclusion. So when the, the financial system starts to do that, cash will be reallocated to the right to to the right decision making. And when we talked about um, the tension, who was on the panel talking about East South and the imbalance and the fact that uh, 
the citizens want something simple. What are your federal, municipal, provincial, private, public? Use the cash to do the right thing. Use the cash to drive value in the right way. So if we use the right indicators to channel the cash in the right direction, we should be able to make progress. And central banks, investors, are required to enable us. Money matters. And it's hard uh, to do the right things if you don't have the, the financial flows. There's no more fiscal capacity to tax more, but you could shift the fiscal allocation to be able to drive public and private sector money in the right direction. I just I noted that um, something that I came across, and it, it's, um, it's relevant to what you were saying, but there's lots of different standards of getting the people to work together and getting these things, and market alludes to this as well. There's a great uh, clip that I think I would recommend people see. It's a very visceral clip. It's um, from the late, great Robin Williams. It's in one of the old movies he did. He's playing a Russian immigrant who comes to America looking for coffee, goes to the supermarket, just starts going through the brands, never seen them before, because he's from Soviet Union, gets to the end and just collapses in a heap under coffee. Like, I can't choose, it's too much, just give me coffee. I don't care what brand it is, just give me coffee. I think that's the key. I think that's where we need to go. We need to look at that. That's a, too much solution can be almost a problem. Karen, let me ask you the same question. What do you think? Um, where have we gone wrong so far? Where do we need to get to go right? Oh yeah, it's on, perfect. Um, I'm gonna take us in, in a whole other area here and really look to what kind of society are we creating? What kind of leaders of tomorrow are we creating? And by that, I mean, who is driving the conversation of the teenagers, the kids, the 20 year olds today? Anybody, anybody? YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and so when I think about how we have these very critical discussions at a very critical time, I think about who is not in the room, what conversations are they having or not having, what influences are on them. And the role of social media, I think, is grossly underestimated and potentially even causing us more damage, more harm than we even have bothered to explore. And I say this because I have an eight-year-old niece who just had a birthday party a month ago with like 20 other eight-year-olds, you know, and it was all about like Josie and Jojo and all these stars. And I think, you know, what's the role of social media in the current conversation if we want to kick it up to our level? You know, we have Leo and Ruffalo and, you know, what other a Hollywood star who's elevating these conversations within their platforms. But I challenge that. Are they doing us a favor? Who are they speaking for? What messages are they sending? Are they well thought out? What perspectives are they platforming? What's the end goal? And so I think we ought to consider this. To what degree have we let a society obsessed with fame and likes and visibility solves some of our largest and most complex problems uh, that we're facing today. So just a bit of thought on that front. And Sanjay, if I can talk to you, turn to you as have, having screwed up our past, do we have a future? <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy question to answer. And I'm... I'm grateful for it. Um, I'd like to thank Capital Hubs Canada just for organizing this event and, and bringing all of us uh, together. So I'm a futurist. My work is in multiple areas of foresight, uh, developing scenarios to um, understand plausible futures and how things might might play out. And you you asked about you know why um, we are where we are. Well, part of what we do in foresight is really look at history. Um, what has got us to where we are? Uh, so we understand the path dependency that's been created um, by not addressing problems raised by Silent Spring in the late 50s, um, by not addressing climate change <clears throat> starting in 1988, when James Hansen spoke to Congress uh, about global warming and the, and the climate crisis. Um, and I think we're, we're now, my, my work focuses on something called converging crises. 
the era of converging crises, which is the building up of geopolitical change with climate change, with technological acceleration, with physical and mental health declines at the population scale, and with social and economic reordering, the shrinking of the middle class and the rise in wealth and poverty. Those things are building up to create destructive synergies, not addressing any one of the crises with sufficient resources will mean that any one of the crises you're trying to address could be undermined by the other crisis. So to give you an example, social division, mis and disinformation will make it harder to deal with biodiversity crises and climate. It will also be harder to deal with uh, economic and social inequality. So, you know, Karen's comment about the role of social media, that was work I was doing in 2000, 2004, 2005, is trying to understand what the impact would be of widespread digital technology. So I think we're in the crisis, we're in the converging zone, and we see it with the pandemic. I'm wearing a mask right now because there's a pandemic caused by human encroachment on natural systems, which has reached Canada, which is causing the Children's Hospital of the Montreal Children's Hospital to ask people to wear masks because kids are filling up pediatric wards. That is because of a pandemic. That's because of the biodiversity crisis. Why are we not in this room heeding the head of the Children's uh, Hospital of Eastern Ontario, the Montreal Children's Hospital, to get our masks on? This is a mitigation, and we're not doing the mitigations for biodiversity. It means stopping doing crummy things that are going to damage the life support systems of our home planet. And I work with um, two colleagues, <clears throat> one who is uh, the head, former head of the Arctic Science Research Program for NOAA in the United States, and the other who is the presidential advisor to two presidents on climate change and ran a $3 billion research program per year to try to understand what is going on. We are all deeply, profoundly concerned about the question you've asked and how we focus the minds of leaders in businesses and across society to collaborate on this. And I'll stop there. So I want to start looking at now the positive. So we've said what went wrong and how do we start getting it right? What do we actually do that's different? So Karen, I'd like to start with you. How do we actually begin to change the way we're doing this? Yeah, I like how Sanjay said he's a futurist. I, I'm going to give some thought to that. I might start describing myself as such as well, but I'd have to explore what it, what it means to me in, in my own context and experience. I think we would benefit a lot of all considering solutions, forward-looking thoughts and considerations for uh -huh, the next seven generations. I suppose there potentially could be some overlap. We heard from the previous panel um, some points that I'd like to touch on. Uh, indigenous laws, natural law, uh, indigenous legal principles, considerations for the next seven generations. And all of that, I like to wrap up in a term called a way of life. Some of you might have heard it described as indigenous rights this week in some of the sessions. I refer to it as a way of life that's protected by section 35 of the constitution and thereby becomes an Indigenous right. And I'm describing a way of life of my family currently that balances it, um, that exercises that way of life in balance with modernity. Uh, moder mo I always mess up this word. <laughs> Say it for me, modernity. 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 Um, I, spoke, I, I, I grew up speaking French and English at home, so some of these words I still struggle to pronounce, but... Um, and this is a way of life that is exercised today, um, and, uh, but has also been exercised since time immemorial, guided by principles of sustainability, accountability, a balance, a connection, relationships, as we heard from Chief Joe. This is a way of life that has been exercised prior to contact, 
not the same across different indigenous nations, but much less, uh, very much so aligned with one another in terms of the principles that guided the day-to-day, -day, that guided each nation's legal systems and governance systems. And the question that I like to pose today is, why is it that in 2022, all Canadians can't be exercising that way of life? And we touched on that a little bit on the first panel, but why can't we be guided by the original principles of these lands exercised and established by the original peoples of these lands. What would the Canadian constitution look like today? What would the charter look like today? What would federal policy look like today? And I'm not talking some weird juju like top down hierarchy where indigenous people are coming in to take over. That actually doesn't, although it sounds like it'd be a great Hollywood film <laughs> that doesn't actually align with who we are and the systems and the principles on which we stand. It's much more aligned with the concept of respecting our differences while also aligning ourselves on those basic principles. And I think when we talk about a way forward, we have to bring it from the conceptual into the everyday life. How are we exercising these principles in everything that we do? I have just a wrap up thought. I have these very awesome conversations uh, when uh, we gather at our family home with my brothers, particularly the one brother. And I'll walk in, I'll be like, oh, I was reading on climate this week and insert you know long terms technical terms and the one brother will turn to me and he'll be like what are you talking about and i think that's a great reminder for us all particularly in this room there's nothing wrong with talk, thought leadership it's necessary but at the same time we have to touch base with reality we have to think about what's being done on the ground the conversations that are driving action and making sure that we're using words that everybody understands and that everybody can get behind. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good. Emery, I'm going to turn to you because I'm going to ask you sort of a question based on that. So in terms of the way of life, how do you, how do you think we can put that idea in synergy with a small business owner who's just trying to feed his kids and going, yeah, but what does that mean for me? How does that work? I'm going to get there, but I'm going to start where they were. <laughs> um, I come from Maniwaki, right besides Kirigan Zibi. Uh, I can't change the past. I had the privilege to work with you, Biela, with you, Javada. Uh, when we wanted to, to OCISSB, the organization that's going to set the rules for investors globally in Canada, uh, we sought support from First Nations. We wanted to make sure we had their support and that their voice would be heard. When we got the office, so you helped us, we did it together. Um, the first people that Giovanna put on the agenda, uh, together with others who wanted that to happen, were the people we did not listen enough to in our past. And yesterday, the ISSB, uh, and, and they made a presentation that was just absolutely fantastic. How can you talk about sustainability? Without our voice, we're six percent of the population, eighty percent fiduciary responsibility to protect uh, biodiversity on the planet. So it's just obvious. What are you say? Uh, other stats were 
5%, 85%, they're actually right, okay? We're not gonna do an audit uh, at 95% level of assurance. <laughs> they're actually right. So it was obvious to the lead, the global leaders who were here that First Nations had to be there. And yesterday when they appointed Jordi to make sure as we, and, and the First Nations community offered, like we want to create a global people first movement to be heard globally as you set the rules of the game for investors. So we have G20 finance ministers that are working with this, and we have people first at the table. So now it's very nice to have those standards. I need a, I need a Kleenex here or someone. <laughs> so, well, I have some in my purse over there. C'est bon, François. <laughs> C'est bon, c'est passé. It's over. I might need one, though. So, um, we can set the rules for investors globally, uh, but, but we need political leaders, federal, municipal, uh, First Nations leaders, uh, provincial leaders, to understand that the challenges we face require every single dollar to move in the right direction, will require foundations, will require private money, public sector money to be guided by the type of measures we're talking about. So we need blended finance instruments. We have Jin Dong Hua, who was appointed vice chair of the ISSB here in Montreal, his mandate is to help SMEs. Because you set those standards and the consultation process, small businesses don't know where to start. I can't find staff. I have challenges preparing my financial returns. I have, you talk to the CEOs of the banks and Guy Desjardins, he says, I have 360,000 clients to help. Like, how the heck do I do that? I want to, but, so we will have to join forces together to find tools, simplify the landscape. So what governments is asking, we have regulation for quality of air, for water, for the, so Montreal has this, Laval has this, Maniwaki has that, the Toronto has something else. We need consistency in the, the measures that matter for collective success that will be embedded in every financial decision, climate, biodiversity, and we need to work together to, to for, for capacity building, whether it's technology, whether it's tools, whether it's the measurement that's required, make it easier, get, get government to, Ministère de l'Economie et Innovation, et cetera, to work in the same direction. We need that, we need political leaders who, who understand they don't have more fiscal capacity, but it can shift brown subsidies to green subsidies. They can shift money around, and previous panel, someone said it, there will be some people left behind. We can't, we can't write off assets, we can't write off the people. I'd like to go back, for example, to uh, one, one large corporation, Fortis Corporation, not to name it. They have a plan to, they, they produce electricity. They have less than 1% of their electricity produced with coal. Well, get rid of that, eh? that's what the investors are asked to do. They have a plan to get rid of that over 10 years. But to get rid of that over, overnight, we have three First Nations communities with no power and most of the people with no job. We need transition finance, we need public sector money, private sector money in place to change the source of energy for those three First Nations communities. We need to provide new alternatives energy. We need to retrain the people who have no job to give them the ability to feed their children. So when we're all aligned on, on the right priorities and all the flow of cattle goes to the right priorities, we're gonna be fine. So that's what we're, we need to do, reset capital markets. Sanjay, can I turn to you? Um, talking about that, like, how do we, the idea of people being left behind and the, the anger and desperation that, and the political ins instability that creates. I live in Ottawa, I'm from Toronto, but I live in Ottawa, saw the truckers' convoy. Yeah, some people thought they were nuts, but they, there was genuine anger. How do we deal with that so it doesn't distort the politics and 
act as a drag or a hindrance on what we're trying to do? Um, once social divisions have been uh, allowed to fester to the extent that they have, and people see their economic interests n misaligned with um, how the world is changing and how they imagine it might be governed, um, this is going to actually, it's going to create a drag. And I'm not sure that's what you can eliminate. Um, speaking to the um, issue of desperation, um, I've been speaking to an organization based out of the United States that's been doing some global polling on, um, on consumer sentiment around the world. Um, it, tens of thousands of people taking the survey. This is the strongest signal they felt in both Global North and Global South of a strong signal of desperation. Mm -hmm. And that is today. That is not tomorrow. Desperate people are very difficult to target with behavioral strategies unless the behavioral strategies are dis or misinformation. <coughs> dis and misinformation moving into a desperate pop population is going to make it pretty hard to address the legislative and other issues. And one of the big challenges from a behavioral science standpoint, but also from a governance standpoint and from the individual choices standpoint, is going to be how we're going to help people who feel sadder and more desperate. There's a crisis related to mental health and climate change and, and young people feeling very desperate and worried about what the future might turn out to be is how to heal that and that means people need to be fed there need to be programs to deal with food insecurity that we're going to have throughout the recession and the other piece is in terms of political instability because of the biodiversity crisis which is also associated with resource depletion and resource related crises um, there's going to be much more um, geopolitical conflict and we're entering a time of war driven by not globalization itself but the kind of unhealthy globalization that we've seen and we're seeing it across populations the United States life expectancy has declined by six years over the past three years because of the pandemic and 400 people a day are still dying there Per capita, Ontario is at about 338 people if we're going to do a direct comparison, um, you know, per day. So we have to, the behavioral piece is going to be how do we help people feel calmer and have more agency as their quality of life is sort of stripped away. If I can uh, yeah, please, I was gonna say. grab the ballot bon there. Um, yeah, so some of the the ways that I would think about this as well is trying to um, to heal that rift, right? So what does the what does the road back look like from that kind of division? Um, collective deliberation is a is a very powerful thing. Um, it helps people to feel included. Um, it helps people to deal with uh, senses of not being heard, not being valued, senses of desperation, senses that nothing that they do actually matters and has an impact. Um, which can drive them to more and more extreme actions just to see if they can actually provoke something to happen. Um, so collective deliberation can be really powerful in that respect. And so in, you know, in, in discussing the role of behavioral science here, one of the things that I would think about is how can we use um, what it is that we learn through the behavioral sciences to um, make people more receptive to engaging in collective deliberation? How can we use it to structure those deliberations in ways to um, make conversations more inclusive? And I realize that that's a very kind of empty term. Let me unpack that a little bit. Problem framing is a separate thing from developing solutions and testing solutions. How can we um, use the tools of behavioral science to delay the kind of convergence of a conversation to actually open the space for people to put their perspectives out there on the table? Because that's where the the feeling heard starts is actually having the opportunity to speak what it is that you want to speak and to know that there is a structured process that that feeds into such that you're not just kind of putting it out there on, into the ecosystem, unburdening yourself and saying, 
<sighs> well, I'm glad I got that off my chest, and now absolutely nothing is going to change, right? So it you may be to... talking about food in conversation banks, yeah, <laughs> bringing yeah. together people who need material needs together, yeah, with meeting their their security needs, their yeah. their human security needs. That's maybe. right. Yeah. So you know, how can we use behavioral sciences to create spaces that are more um, effective for um, for kind of divergent thinking and problem framing and then convergent thinking and you know arriving and how it is that we're going to frame the problem um, and how it is we're all going to align behind that problem framing and then the same thing again in the kind of second half of that design process how are we ideating effectively and, and deferring judgment when you know uh, putting out potential solutions and then once again converging on which solutions we're actually going to kind of shortlist and 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 try out um, thank you by the way to the the lady who raised uh, design in this context before, I think that that's a really uh, important discussion to have. These are these are uh, aspects of design, and you know, if I can kind of summarize one of the challenges that we've had with behavioral science is that we've had a really really narrow idea of who can be a designer. That you know, there's someone who controls that conversation. Public consultations, we collect all of the input from you. We make decisions about how the problem is going to be framed. We decide on which solutions we are going to shortlist. And then we go out and try to get buy-in and try to kind of sell our solution to other people. They're extremely exclusive in terms of design processes. What does a design process look like that is more inclusive and more participatory? And that shifts behavioral scientists and designers and other technocrats, let's just call them that as a big umbrella term, it shifts us much more into a facilitating role where we're helping to give structure to the conversation, but the conversation fundamentally doesn't belong to us. We are its stewards. How fast can we do that? Because uh, there are seven harvests between, 20, uh, between now and 2030. Uh, seven harvests. Mm -hmm. And agriculture is food safety, it's food security, it's a lot of the emissions, and it's a lot of the uh, land that is going to the wrong so so how fast can we move in that direction to to open the minds and get social awareness consensus to move in the right direction and to get our political leaders to be able to do the right things when there are farmer votes in every writing if I can okay. actually just add a question to that. Oh, sorry, Karen, go ahead. Well, before Brooke goes ahead and Sanjay goes ahead and answers that, I have a similar example. So in preparing for today, uh, I came across the province of Quebec's announcement that they were very proud that there was no oil and gas production happening in the province. And then I kept digging, and I also learned that it has the highest usage of SUVs across the country. And 60% of buildings here are, are, are heated with gas on the island of Montreal, right? gas or oil. And but so we don't want that. We well, don't, well, exactly. We don't want eating. <laughs> when you talk about design of system and when you talk about leadership, right, we're making large scale proclamations of how proud we are and patting ourselves on the back that we're not doing this one terrible thing that Alberta is doing really well. Look at us. We're so great. And yet we're using Alberta oil and gas to fuel our lifestyle that we continue to exercise mm -hmm. here without giving thought into, by extension of what I offered as a solution, the, the individual role and responsibility that we have in carrying out those mandates. Mm -hmm. And there is a question of how do you shift behavior? How do you shift mindset? Does it wanna be shift, shifted? Also, what are the regional differences? We're sitting downtown Montreal. I know that my brothers are never going to light up an EV snowmobile anytime soon and drive it 20 <laughs> kilometers into the bush. And lo and behold, in minus 20 degree weather, oh, the battery gave out. There's no cell phone service. How much? I'm not calling an Uber, right? <laughs> so there are practicalities around all of this. I think that to your point about harvest and, you know, and, and transportation and key infrastructure, linking back to Brooke's statement about who's designing these <laughs> leading public consultations and then saying, poo poo for you, here's what we're issuing, deal with it. Like there has to be a meeting in the middle and some practical solutions around some of this. If I can just jump in actually, just as a, a sort of question, bridge, this is actually an unplanned question, but it's a bridging question. I think it builds on both points is the messaging itself. How do we get that right? Because I was looking around the, the room, like, you know, all the office buildings. I could I could bet a lot of people, if they would just look in here, you get half of the buildings in here going, 
God, this room is so woke. Wow, I don't care about any of this stuff. And yeah, on the other side, you get there's a distinct undertone in the um, in 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 the cop, not with business, but they're going. You know, the business influence is too strong. Really, these guys. If only we could shut down. How do we? get a meeting in the middle so people are actually beginning to even just communicate rather than just going you're evil you're evil you know well, I was just going to say Brooke and Brooke and Karen are, are doing this lovely thing which is talking about co-design meaningful engagement in design processes for um, for solutions and that's an actual it's quite a deep deep practice. So one of the things I do is I teach at the Royal College of Art in London in the service design program, linking foresight with service design. And we founded something there called the Livable Planet Challenge Lab. And it's there to kind of bring together design sort of expertise with companies and with different stakeholders to build something out. What's been learned through that process at the Royal College of Art around service design more broadly is that it takes about five years to get to the point where you've developed the trust you need to have and the coalitions, and then a second five-year phase where you're really building and expanding on the solutions you've co-designed and that everyone trusts is actually useful, and then using those lessons to help other people do it. So there isn't, like there's this profound arc of engagement that you know has to be trusted and trustworthy to get to some of the kind of deeper things you, both of you are sort of discussing and as well as uh, yeah. you know, Anne-Marie and, and, and you, David. If I can pick up just very quickly, um, in terms of where to start and how to start, if, if you and someone else are sitting across the table and neither of you is listening to the other and each of you has some resources to open up kind of forums for conversation, um, if it's really important to you that that conversation happen, don't wait for the person across the table to shut up and listen to you. Like you need to take the onus and take the responsibility and take the initiative to say, I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to open a space to listen to you. This space exists for you to come here and be understood because I want to understand you. And now I'm gonna put down the microphone. Maybe one suggestion for Capital Labs. Um, this conversation on climate started 2016 where the financial community investors listen to scientific community and they had a lot of progress in six years and when we had the what shocked me the most last weekend is um, one of the panels had um, one loop with all the players and every session you attend there's a few of them so there's already a coalition of people setting standards that are working together, moving in the same direction. A group of people measuring impact, moving in the same direction. A group of people, so you see it's all the same players in the, in the loop that are connected to G20, connected to IWF, connected to YOSCO, connected to, this, the, 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 to OECD, connected to the scientific community. So let's make sure we leverage on the ones that are influencing the allocation of capital that we're informing the decision let's not create more let's do exactly what you're doing uh coll drive collaboration so we amplify the voice of each other instead of starting new messages so if i can go on to my next question my next plan question actually and i think this is sort of beginning uh Anne Marie, i'm going to turn to you first because i think this is beginning where where i want to go what are the tangibles how do we actually, what do we start to actually do? Everyone in this room, how do we reach our, our friends and colleagues who may not be in the room? You know, the people who are not, not just preaching to the choir and not just people in the congregation, but the people who, how do we get the people outside the church to actually begin to, like Brooks said, have those conversations and begin to maybe take some action? So, well, what I'm doing, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm waking up every morning. What do I do to drive convergence and adoption of sustainability standards? And uh, that would be measure nature, measure biodiversity, measure inequalities, measure you need a financial return to help investors and my client, investors ask my clients to um, 
to drive a return while driving value for more people in society. Help the investors put the risk management framework in place to integrate those factors into capital allocation decision and help the clients move in that direction. Collectively, and I'll give you an example, we're working with, with Desjardins, a cooperative, RBC, largest seven, seventh largest bank in Canada in the world, BDC, Business Development Bank. For them to explore, okay, how can you join force? You have 360,000 clients to help. You have a million clients to help. You have, can we do a few things together to help the small businesses in, in this country? It's 90% of the economy. And identify where the roadblocks are. So if you're trying to change agriculture and the things you do, now just look at the fertilizer conversation this morning. Um, well, it's costing too much we need to, to give back to the, f the farmers because they pay too much for fertilizer. Well, we're all saying we need to go back to regenerative ag. Huh? Huh? Are you going to give money for this or are you going to use the money, Christian, to shift to ag and help them make the transition? We'll need cash for the transition. The farmers will not be able to feed their children if we don't support them during the transition. So are we using our voices to coordinate efforts? So that's what I'm trying to do every day. And clients want to do that with us. Sanjay, Sanjay can I turn to you, please? Sure. Yeah, I think we're seeing, um, what I'm seeing anyway, speaking to board directors, uh, some around the world, some in Canada, um, executive management of some very big organizations, is it even when they have good intentions, they're sometimes hiring the wrong consultants who actually don't know the science, who don't know mm. what they're talking about when they're translating things over because of the management consultancy business model of billable hours. Um, and so the best expertise is not being used to address the issues. I think that's one piece. Also the, the translation of scientific knowledge to the language that's understood, which is really a grade five level. If you're working in the center of uh, the government, you're trying to get things down to a grade five level so a policymaker or um, a politician can kind of understand that. So I think there's a profound issue about how we create knowledge that people can absorb because the crises are so big and so overwhelming that absorbing that knowledge, taking it on and translating it to an organization is super difficult. And I think the maybe the, just the second thing I'd mention is uh, I want to pick up on the chiefs on the earlier panel, her comment about uh, uplifting uh, women and caregivers. Um, but I'd say anyone who's in a caregiving, LGBTQ+, plus, you know, whatever, whatever position they're in, is that the nurses and caregivers are holding the bag on the biodiversity crisis that's led to the pandemic. And if we don't uplift those people who are going to take care of us, what we're seeing in the foresight world is there are going to be more pandemics. There's going to be more of these things that come at us that are going to be even more virulent. So if we're not uplifting the caregivers and the people who are willing to take risk to help us be healthy, because this is profoundly, the whole biodiversity conversation is about health. It's about human health not being at the center of our uh, economic and social and political systems. Um, and so if health isn't the thing we're safeguarding and defending, it's not going to work moving forward in terms of getting people engaged deeply on this issue. So, yeah. I would agree, by the way, about the um, government thing. I'm glad Senator Rose is not here, but I've been told when I'm writing briefs, if I have more than three syllables, I get yelled at. <laughs> Karen, please. Yeah, what I heard when you were speaking, Sanjay, was um, Big Bang Theory, less Sheldon talk, right? Yeah, but you got to love Sheldon. You got to love Sheldon. There's a role for Sheldon, right? There's a role for everyone. <clears throat> I think I agree with you. Like, we have to recognize, coming back to my, my first point about, you know, ways of life, laws, governance systems, um, each community each individual within a community has a responsibility to bear and they uphold that role um, in, in, at the individual level. And only when they exercise the gifts that they carry do, does the collective benefit. And it's not to say that each individual 
lives within its own bubble. When each individual exercises their gifts, we end up forming one collective and it really speaks to the strength of that collective is how I related to what you shared, Sanjay. Um, I did have a thought on Anne Marie's uh, proposal, but at the individual level, uh, when you talk about small and medium business, and I totally just gapped on it. <laughs> Actually, before I turn to Brooke though, Karen, I just want to ask you one thing about that. I want to unpack that a little bit. How do you teach that? If somebody's not had that experience, that lived experience, and somebody's coming at this new, somebody who is looking at this going, yeah, well, I don't know if that's for me. How do you begin to teach that to somebody? How do you get them to take the first steps? Yeah, like I appreciate that's a foreign concept, what I'm proposing here. I'm saying, go back to um, the original peoples of these lands, the original systems, the guiding principles. That's a bold statement today. Right in a world where we talk about diversity and honoring our differences, for me to sit up there and say, "No, check yours at the door and consider, you know, the original principles that my nation uh, has been guided by." Listen, I'm not saying I'm here to railroad everyone in the room and who's connected online. Um, again, that's not aligned with how we do business. Um, but I, I would invite everyone to consider that thought. When we say we support reconciliation, what does that look like? Same concept with land back. No one's saying go back to, you know, your fourth generation prior to where the immigration happened. Like no one's saying like, we're going to take over your Muskoka cottage, you know? <laughs> no one's saying that. With the sinking lake levels and uh, anyway. <laughs> And the lack yeah. of fish, right. Yeah, with all the problems. <laughs> yeah, no one, no one is saying that, but we are saying consider, consider history. How do we right the wrongs? And it's very much aligned with our theme here is how do you right the wrongs, right? Prior to industrialization, did we face the challenges that we have today? Well, indigenous people took care of these lands and waters for a very long time. So as much as it's not our responsibility to fix the course that has gone very much sideways, I think we can appreciate that perhaps the guiding principles could be part of the solution. And that's not one responsibility that we would take on ourselves, but one that we would want to take on together. Brooke, can I ask you to pick up on some of that as well, please? Um, yeah, sure. One of the, the pieces that I think connects nicely there with some of the, the threads of discussion we've been having around um, around convergence and, and collective deliberation is around the idea of leadership. Like, if we think about the richness of diversity as, you know, providing lots of different options for how we might address challenges that we face, right? It may be the case that, um, you know, settler culture was particularly adaptive for addressing certain kinds of problems. Like if we think about the like kind of the standardizing and and like mechanizing instinct from Western philosophy, like that's really well aligned with a like an early industrial world where you gain tons and tons of efficiency through that kind of standardization. We're now facing different kinds of challenges. We're facing kinds of challenges that are not about, you know, simply like scaling up production as quickly as possible. We're facing challenges around how to make people feel heard and included. Um, where is it in the world that we find leadership styles that are best adapted to that? Is it settler culture where we've got a whole bunch of like old white dudes who look like me plus 50 years who are just saying like, this is the way that it's going to be and hammering their fist down on the table. How I'm, I'm going to interject here. Yeah. <laughs> There's a role for everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even for old me. Yeah, even, even for the folks you've just referenced, there's a role for everyone. Right. <laughs> um, but you know, this concept of service leadership that is so like, oh, wow, you know, it's like, it's all whiz bang right now. We, we all need to be service leaders. We all need to be serving the people in our organization. It's going to be great. They're going to be so served. Um, <laughs> that is a concept that in many ways uh, is similar to ideas of leadership that are extremely long standing in other communities, including many indigenous communities. So why is it that all of a sudden we've got this whiz bang new concept that we are going to build from zero, we're going to reinvent the wheel instead of 
talking to people who have actually been working with and articulating and refining a concept like that over hundreds of years who might know a thing or two and help us to accelerate that process towards um, you know, a, like adapting and deploying a model that really helps to create the kinds of inclusive discussions that we need really badly right now. Can I maybe simplify that a bit? Um, I'll make it really simple. <laughs> really simple and uh, work, working with both of you here. It takes a long time to develop a wise person. To become a wise person is the culmination of a whole life of learning what it is to be a person and learning what it is to be part of a community and part of a society and part of a, an environment and ecosystem. That is hard to build in a short, the short time we have to deal with these crises. So the question is, how can we work together to be wiser, faster, and move together? Whoever can move in that direction, because not everyone will be able to do that. I just suggest as we move into this recession and things get tougher for Canadians, for all, us, all of us to be thinking about what's going to happen to our cities and communities, who's going to be hungry, who's going to need things, how are we going to make sure they aren't suffering more than is absolutely necessary? mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. If I can just add a point on that, Sandra. I, I once had a teacher say to me that, you know, it does take a long time to become wise and it takes a long training, but you can also die stupid. So it, it's very important. Henry, please, you had a comment. Uh, we're here cup 15. That's about the water we drink or we use daily for critical usage. It's about the food we eat. That's about the hair we breed. Every citizen would like to have proper food, air, water, one would think. Uh, the conversation is about who's going to pay for this. There's not enough fiscal room in the advanced economy to face all those crises here and, and deal with the problems we're co causing in the South. We sadly have, not the citizens, but financial leaders of the world who do not understand that this is all about transforming the capital markets to enable re massive reallocation of all the investment money to fix those solutions. So it's pretty sad that it's not the citizens we're trying to teach. Uh, what have we done wrong? So our political leaders don't get it. I, ju I just remembered my point. <laughs> if, and I'll make it quick. I don't know where we're at for time, but we're we're on we're on fire over here. Um, Henry, earlier you, you talked about uh, like accountability and responsibility and who's paying for it, and I think that's a large problem today. You have leaders who are you know forging ahead towards a vision that not everyone shares or understands or understands how it's real. Um, and these leaders are turning around and saying, this is a beautiful idea that is going to be made real by you on the ground, the farmer, the harvester, the indigenous person harvesting on the land at the cost of small and medium business, um, large corporations, perhaps. We haven't really talked about that a whole lot, but nonetheless like that's problematic like when you talk about quality of leadership like being a leader isn't i have a good idea and all y'all are going to pay for it now right like that is a huge problem and so maybe you have those conversations before you go ahead and implement that policy in my view to talk we talked about you know behavioral science how do we get there how do we design those systems um, I'm a huge, I mean, by way of, you know, where I come from, the conversations happen at length. They last a long time. We hit consensus. Consensus doesn't mean you agree with absolutely everything that's been said or what we're going to do, but you now understand it enough that you can get behind it because it makes sense. Like, where is that today in terms of what we're here to discuss? So not a solution, but a question. Yeah, I mean, 
I just feel like Karen provided a massive service to the panel. To me, part of what I'm hearing from that is pay attention to who the real leaders are in your surroundings, whether they're in your company, whether they're in your community, who are the people who are acting and moving in directions that uphold the best of what it is to be a person right now? And where is that wisdom right now that we can draw upon to help us take the next step? Um, I'll just very piffily uh, insert that uh, the American right a long time ago realized it's easier to make a pro-lifer into a politician than a politician into a pro-lifer. So don't try to, you know, say, oh, well, you know, we're going to make these politicians so wise and this kind of thing. It starts with the decisions that we make about the leadership that we will show, which doesn't have to be in political spaces. <coughs> we show leadership every day in all kinds of different spaces. And if we hang all of our hopes and expectations on the the political apparatus being the only place where societal leadership happens, I think we are really shortchanging ourselves. Just before I open it up to the audience, one last question, and I think because this is a launch of the Canada Hub, uh, the Capitals Hub Canada, I want to drop back to us. So we're here, we're a new organization, we're hopefully going to uh, grow and become more, um, more efficient. My question to the panel is, um, if you were giving us advice, which you are going to give us advice, what would you suggest we do to help actually move us along? What can we do concretely? that would actually be useful, both for Canada and since Mark and uh, Martin are still here, internationally as well, what can we do that will actually be useful? Sanjay, let me start with you. Um, down the panel. Well, this is gonna be really controversial, so I'll, um, I'd say- I wanted to be the one to be the controversial one. <laughs> Fist bump. There's okay, room enough for can, everybody. <laughs> you can out controversial. I wore red. I was like, I want to be the fire. You can out controversial me. Go for it. And anyone can in this crowd can out controversial me. Um, I think you got to stop using the word capital so much. Just the shaping of, of the language of capitalism into natural capital, social capital, financial capital. I get the concept of capital hubs, but I think the language needs to. Um, really reframe that because once once you start thinking that way it creates a whole bunch of other problems this is a human challenge about how we use money and other resources and how we think about things if i viewed my child growing up as a form of capital child capital <laughs> you know or my friends as friendship capital i would not be able to phone him right now he would, you know, so I think language really matters to humanize the very, very laudable goals that Capital Hubs has internationally. And I think it's a hugely important initiative, and that, that would be my caution. Um, Karen. Yeah, my, my biggest thing, I guess, these days is, like, diversity of perspective. As an Indigenous woman, I get invited to speak often to events, and everyone just assumes I'm a left-leaning socialist that, you know, frolics on the pine trail forests to the colors of the wind and whatnot. And I'm just like, <laughs> have we met? I am the last, if that's what you want, I'm sure you can hire them all the way from Hollywood, but that's not what I'm offering here. So I think we need to be ready Indigenous nations are diverse by nature. Mine has long prioritized its economy, and as a result, we've enjoyed a very strong social fabric. We are very competitive. We like to win. We like to make money. And these are things that Joe Canadian is not used to hearing. But to Sanjay's point, we know how to humanize our relationships. We don't live in that black and white world where nothing there's no emotion. We feel, we relate to one another, we celebrate one another fiercely. We gather, we know what's important, and we bring that balance. And coming back to that ideology, that way of life, it is about balance. You're not whole until you're balancing all aspects of yourself. So encouraging, as you continue on the journey, to bring in varied perspectives because only when we hear from everyone are we really going to be able to understand the bigger picture 
and with that, a clear sense of where things are headed. I said it earlier to a certain extent, there's a few organizations from the scientific community, from the standard setting community, from the, uh, uh, from the UN, that are quite well coordinated to drive the shift of capital to sustainable growth. So whatever you do in Canada, connect it to the global influencers. There's no point, we're such a small economy uh, we need to drive and do it right home, lead by example, and we should, and learn from the others because we're way beyond Europe or UK or Uganda yesterday to a certain extent when we talked to the finance ministers, but anyhow, uh, so in terms of where they're at and measuring the quality of the ecosystems and the capital required to restore. Um, so, so, so we can't make it local. It has to be connected to global. And inclusive um two things and i'll try to keep them succinct one senator galvez said disclosure is important but it's not enough um and i will finally say something nice about behavioral science on this panel just as we're wrapping up <laughs> and that is that uh we need good decision making systems so we need the right pro you know we need the right standards we need the right data we need the right incentives but we also need good practice in decision making and that's a huge piece um, and the other is that in the kind of three phase plan that you were outlining about what the, the capitals hub globally is working on, the very last thing that you said is like starting to put it into practice. My innovators brain is like practice should have been way up at the top when you just throw something at people and like see how they react and then kind of refine that based on how it is that people um, uh, uh, behave when they're kind of confronted with this thing and, and iterate quickly. So decision systems and rapid iteration. Can I just uh, go back to, um, you challenged me on what we should expect of politicians, but um, good decision making and incentives, as a minimum, we should expect of our political leader to remove the bad incentives and replace by good ones. Yep. <laughs> Are we gonna go down that road? <laughs> well, it's kind of a basic expectation. If they don't get I, it you. and they continue to to subsidize the wrong, that's hard. Listen, to I was get nice the rest earlier. to follow. Like I, I think it's lazy leadership, right? When you put it all on the citizen and on the small business, and that it, like it's just purely lazy lazy leadership. You're not exercising and pushing yourself to consider all policy options and how they functionally how they function uh, in, a, in a very practical way, right? And so like, I guess that's a huge theme that I didn't think would come out of this conversation at all, but nonetheless, maybe that that's for the after show. Oh, we have someone <laughs> sitting in well, Ottawa, would, influence your friends there. I would just say that I'm not, I'm not an English major, but I always understood the word leadership came from the word lead, as in not following polls, but actually leading and maybe taking risks and actually not. Sure. Anyway. I'm holding a mic and I've been asking a lot of questions, which I love doing, but I want to open it up to the audience. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. Does anyone have any questions for this panel? Yeah, over here, please. Uh, here first, and uh, over there. We'll take a couple of questions. Then, uh, right here first. Uh, sorry, right here first. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, great uh, discussion. Um, I, I'm, I'm from the investment community, so I'm a portfolio manager. So the, the last mile, we talk a lot about uh, diver, you know, diverting capital flows. And, but at the end of the day, these are decisions made by portfolio managers. Um, and um, if I look at Canada, uh, we have to remember that um, finance is a highly, highly intermediated um, sector. So there's, uh, we have a, a, a big agency issue in that sector. Um, divergence of, um, you know, lack of alignment, alignment of interest. And, uh, but I think one of the big issue that we're not talking about is that decisions are being made by 90% um, of portfolio managers are men. And this is the only industry that has gone backward in 15 years. When I started my career 25 years ago, um, I've worked here in Quebec for several institutions and we were at parity. And um, so 25 years later, 2022, 90% of portfolio managers are men. 
um, and with a definitely a problem in incentives, um, not just for men, but for everyone in that uh, in that community. How do you think are going to? How do you think things are going to change if we're not changing that? Um, you know uh, that compensation scheme that rewards the one-year performance, three-year performance, maximum five at best. So a lot of issues in that community that are not being addressed, and capital flows are not going to change until we address that issue. I think there was another question just over there. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, Mark's not disappointed, so this will be uh, interesting. Thank you. Um, I, I've been amazed by this conversation. It's taking me to different places than I was expecting, which is brilliant. Um, I completely agree about action. We should be doing that at the beginning. If I gave the impression that wasn't what I meant, that wasn't what I meant. I think on the word capital as well, um, I've been trolled on media. I, my family have been abused and things like this because people have accused me of being a capitalist like that. I think that what we're trying to do here, and this has been shown in this conversation and the one earlier, is to connect up communities, connect up language. I'm trying to reclaim some of that, what capital should be about. Mm -hmm. And we can't have a monoculture. There can't just be one approach to this. We've got to bring in the businesses, the financial communities that have not been in the conversation we're having. By using that word capital, and redefining what we mean by value, not just putting it out there as it was, but redefining that, trying to claim that as a community again together, that's what we're trying to do. But I don't think that there is only one approach and that the capital's approach is the approach. Just please don't think that. It's one approach of many approaches we've got to take that will hopefully and is showing to bring in those capitalists that up until now have taken no notice. So if we can bring them in by using some of their language, that's what we're trying to do, not trying to say everyone has to be a capitalist. And I hope that maybe that hopes to clarify that a little bit more. But I have been, like I say, fascinated by this. This has been an amazing experience. So, Anne -Marie, let's, uh, let's uh, panel reacting and answering a question and reacting. Please, Anne -Marie, Anne -Marie, first. So what are your pension fund? What are your, when you're an asset manager, you're an insurer, you need to drive a return. Like we want the pension fund to pay the pension when we retire, or we want the insurance company to pay the claims when we get them. So driving a return is not an option. Um, we have a neighbor south where if you're an investor, your fiduciary re your duty is to make money. And we have 17 states so far that say if you ask anything about climate, you're going to be prevented from lending to the municipalities, to the state, da da da, because your job is to make money. What the investment community is trying to do with the ISSB and the scientific community is demonstrate that the types of capital we're talking about are the ones that drive value in the long term. And they have to back the standards with science that demonstrate correlation with those metrics and risk adjusted return in the long term to preserve pre, to, to manage your risk of being sued. <laughs> that's, a, that's exactly what it is uh, next door. So as the market evolves to bring to, to less a culture of the shark and short termism and making money at any cost, as the market shift with the pressure of investors and scientific community with the backup of G20, more women will be attracted to the business and we're going to reverse that trend. More women will be attracted, and, and the, the case that they pull recruits more women than they did in the past, a number of them, they see the trend of being able to attract more women. More women are entering finance and university than a few years ago. We need more in science also. So the change in capital markets will open. More men will want to be in the economy of care, because they care also and more women will be in the science communities and the finance community. So there is hope as we see shift in capitalism to attract more women. Yeah, I mean, to the first of the portfolio manager, I think maybe one, and correct me if I'm wrong, so you feel free to respond to what I'm about to say. But I think what you might be underlying all of this concerned about is high testosterone, the wrong incentives, creating increased risks for further market crashes in key areas. Is that, is that plausible? What is the law of uh, diversity in the industry? It's really what I meant. You know, it's uh, taking the most change 
So I thought about it. We need a different way of measuring debt or measuring um, performance. What yeah, you're saying yeah. is relevant too, though. You're both yeah, no, relevant. no. I mean, I, right. I, I, so yeah, I was just going to say that uh, in a number of um, work around uh, economics and portfolio allocation uh, and men, uh, you know, being involved in that, that's going to increase your risk, uh, depending on what the incentives are. Um, so I think there is an increased risk of market crashes as a result of the aggregation of a 90-10 kind of split. Um, that's one thing. And then to Mark's uh, comment, I, I absolutely agree with you, but I think it's going to be very difficult to use capital to subvert that in the sense that um, the natural capital language has been used for a very long time, and we are really quickly undermining, continue to rapidly undermine the natural capital piece. So I do wonder what your strategies will be to um, uh, to work with that, to work with that language, redefine it, reshape it, reframe it, because what you're trying to do, I'm completely in, aligned with. Can I can I bring a fun analogy to this situation? How many hockey fans here? I know that's not a popular question right now because of like Hockey Canada, but I'm a huge hockey fan. Maple Leafs or not? We're not going to hate everyone because a couple institutional actors took it rogue, right? Like the game, there's a love for the game in this country. So not so long ago, long ago, the NHL decided to change the game. They're like, no more big beefy players who are going to fight in the middle of the ice and tear each other apart and lay down the big hits. We're gonna head, we're gonna bring the game in a new direction. And we're gonna focus on smaller guys who are quick, who can score goals. They took out a line on the ice to make the game move faster. And suddenly the big beefy guys really didn't see a role for themselves, which garnered a lot of critique. People were like, no, we like the fighting and the hits and whatnot, right? And then they had to course correct. And then they found a happy medium. They had a few guys who could hit, a few guys who would fight, a few fast guys who'd go into the corners, clear the puck, some skilled guys who could put the puck in the net. And so we brought balance to a game. We corrected a legacy, really. And, and in hearing this conversation, I think, hey, if the game of hockey can rebalance itself from arguably a testosterone induced strategy to one of balance and really respecting diversity and complimenting and celebrating everyone's contribution, um, then I think we can too in finance. I'll just pick up on that and plug a book that I love. Uh, Roger Martin wrote a book. I can't remember exactly what the title it is. is. It has something to do, there's an analogy with the NFL which is what kind of sparked this. And basically what he talks about is how the NFL has been really successful in improving the quality of the game by limiting the role of the betting markets in the way that it influences the game. And he draws the parallel between that and investment markets, where investment markets are so focused now on the return on the shares and not the real market value that is created by the company. And that kind of shift have, of focus has been massively problematic and actually might continue to be massively problematic if we don't address that issue in, in talking about capital, where we say like, oh, well, what I'm investing for is not the, you know, the kind of regenerative potential of creating more real natural capital. What I'm investing for is the anticipation of the fool who will buy the share from me in the future. Um, if we don't address that problem, we can very well create a different structure of investment market that fails for exactly the same reasons. So addressing this gap between the, the futures market and the real market is a, a thing that needs to be addressed as well. And this also has to do with incentives, right? Because there's so much of short-termism that's like, well, I'm going to you know, release this announcement that's going to like gin up the value of my share just in time for me to reach you know, my, my earnings as a, you know, as a CEO. Um, and so I'm perpetually involved in this game of like ginning things up just in the right moment. And then people get all excited and everyone buys the share and then, you know, reality kind of sets in and the share price drops back down. And then I gin it up again. Like that's not the way that we want companies to be working. 
That's why they're kneeling in front of the finance ministers at the Congress Center. Please regulate the system so we can do what we want to do to drive value. <laughs> Jay is making nasty faces at me, but we're almost at time. But I think we can do one more question. Yep, please, over there. Uh, right there, right there. Um, so my question was originally intended for the previous panel, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. So Jay spoke about needing to take action now and sort out the metrics later. So my question is, do you think that in order for firms to take this do now and figure it out later approach, we need to create a, like, incentivizing value a value proposition perhaps in terms of like insight on like their own firms or like consumer insights like on their industries like i guess my question is kind of like um what metrics would create the most value for firms and like what indicators would be like the element déclencheur for central banks and like political leaders and like large firms to allocate their resources like effectively like we keep talking about what change can we do now but how can we get the big movers to make that change today? That, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, one of the areas that I, I think is interesting is what some brands are doing around um, building their brands around purpose and really trying to align metrics and consumer insights, but also linking that potentially to the circular Kind of economy pieces so there are some things that are happening there that really link science consumers um, business direction um, that i think are kind of interesting and I, I i don't know what the analogs would be at the higher levels in terms of investment decision makers but there's some you know great people in in the room that are thinking about that but it's a it's a really it's a it's a great question i think there there are some hopeful areas good areas to focus attention so to your question, a few years ago, um, you, you had 60 frameworks for ESG metrics, environment, social, ta -da -da. Last year, COP26, November 3rd, they announced that there would be one organization helping investors get the information they want in a consistent way. That was the creation of ISSB that is leveraging the TCFD, Task Force on Climate Financial Disclosure, it started with Climate First. And that's not that long ago when Mark Carney said, okay, we need to get information that's comparable. Not what this marketing department says this, this one says this, and this one, they pick whatever's good for, for the media. Some are doing the right things, but they're not that good at disclosing, and they get a better, uh, a, a better ESG rating that impacts the value of the... So on the climate front, we're in pretty good shape. We need to help small business members. TNFD started on Nature two, we, two years ago. We're getting there, and ISSB announced that they will embrace that biodiversity straight up so business get consistent information. Investors get business report in a consistent way. So the investors have the information they need. And the reporting that they're asking for is measure where you're at. Work with the scientific community to give you targets that are aligned to 1.5 degree. In your sector, based on what you do, you should go down to this science-based target. And whatever you have left, you need to find a way for the emissions that you still have left when you've reduced, find ways to remove from the atmosphere as much as you're putting in the atmosphere. If you can't do that, you shouldn't be in business. We shouldn't invest in your business. So those are taking the actions to move on that pathway. It takes time should get investment they should be in transition fund they should be in they should be allowed sustainable bonds they should pay less for capital they should get better multiples and that's what we're starting to see in the financial markets we need to accelerate that so so we need we need to help smes to embrace we need to drive everyone in that direction so those standards are helping with their consistency to drive allocation of capital so measure now focus on the future give us critical plan and science tells us whether what you plan to do is credible or not so from a governance standpoint it's forward looking it's no longer look at the statements today you we're looking at the plans to get to your target i've been given permission to take one more question so. <laughs> You 
said many, many things today that I clearly, uh, that are brilliant in terms of how the banks are thinking, how are, are, are the insurance company uh, companies. I'm just a good parrot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's something that I don't get personally and professionally is that the fact that so we work for a uh, renewable energy company. And we would qualify probably to all the ESG funds that you can imagine and things like that. But at the end of the day, when we go on the market and when we reach for a loan with a bank, we never get a, a better rate, interest rate, than our competitors that are, you know, GHG emission plus, plus, plus. So it's the same thing with the insurance companies. We don't get a rebate because we take into account the climates and, and I don't understand. Why it's too actually? recent. It's last year. <laughs> it's last year that ISSB was created. The standards are coming. So you don't have consistency. You have a lot of competitors that are have good marketing departments. And you're disclosing the truth. So over time, it's going to pay back when the market is more mature in terms of consistent disclosure. But it's, 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 it was the year of November 3rd. But it's not just a question of disclosure. I think it's also, you said earlier, we should spend all our money now, government, you know, private or public funds directed to doing the good things. I don't understand why banks are still, you know, financing at really low rate company that, that are emitting by GHG emissions to the roof. That's, that's, it, it, it's even not a, a matter of referentials or TCFD or ISSB or CSA or whoever the alphabet will become at some point. It's a matter of they could right now take the money and say, okay, so you're not emitting a lot, a lot perfect. You're gonna be financed at, I don't know, 4%. And everyone else, if you are emitting at, I don't know which level, you will be financed at 7% because you're increasing the risk to the planet. It is really something that is not embodied by the banks and the insurance companies. And I don't understand why, because they, they commit to be net zero in 30 years. Okay, but... Yeah, uh, to, to pick up on the point that I was making earlier, disclosure is not enough. And it, you know, we need the right information, we need the right decision making systems, and we need the leadership there to really push it forward. And we're starting to get to a place where the disclosure kind of frameworks are creating the information, the decision systems are not there, the leadership mm, depends where you go, like across the board, the leadership is definitely not there. But there are some spots where you find it. In, in our dialogue with uh, insurance companies, um, we're seeing a lot of kicking the can down the road, um, a lot of looking for places to de-risk, but not really innovative approaches on the product side. Mm. Um, and, you know, I almost feel like the same people in portfolio management who are filling up your industry are also the people working on the risk side of the insurance business that, who are, who are de-incentivizing people on the product innovation side to do that. And then once they get there, they don't have the product innovation people to think about that problem. So I think there's a human human capital part of that <laughs> that needs to be dealt with. The one thing I don't like about these panels is that they unfortunately have to end. Um, this has been a ex really extraordinary conversation. Can you please join me in thanking uh, our panel?